Thank you for joining us at the Property Guru Asia Real Estate Summit 2021's virtual edition. We'll now hear from our global speakers who are featured in our Accessible Data segment. This segment opens with a keynote from Omid Saberi, Senior Industry Specialist for Green Buildings at the International Finance Corporation World Bank Group. Omid will discuss the improving transparency, accessibility and standards of building and construction around the world through the IFC's Building Resilience Index. Hello, my name is Omid Saberi and I'm here to speak about Building Resilience Index is a product that uh, we have been developing for the property sector uh, in the IFC, part of the World Bank Group. I'm a senior industry specialist and I'm happy to be here present. The key that I wanted to start with was around the fact of where we are with the property sector and how green and resilience conditions is improving. But I want to start with a story. And the story starts from a, a building that is uh, quite interesting to, to see. Let's assume this is one of those buildings. Let's assume this building right here. This building was built by a developer and property owner that wanted to have an investment in property sector. You as an investor, you do this investment, possibly borrow money from the bank for a couple of years uh, to build this, uh, this facility. You know that there is a good um, uptake of people coming and renting places um, in this building. So you do this um, investment. The challenge starts uh, from once now everyone is there, there's a natural disaster. Let's say there's a, an earthquake happened. And after the earthquake, the good thing is that I already built this building uh, as per the code. So the code is already there. Therefore my building didn't fully collapse and nobody died. That, that's good news. Some small injuries. But the key element that happened to this building is that this building is not habitable, habitable anymore. The cost of repair is very high. So everyone left the building now. They're all now residing somewhere else, which I have to pay for their new accommodation. On the other hand, the insurance company is not going to cover this cost. An insurance company will not insure this property anymore because it's already damaged. I also have obligations to the bank, so I have to pay my, my loans back to the bank without having any income from the building. And the cost of repairing this building is so high that I can't afford to repair. If I don't pay, the bank would be in trouble and I will be in trouble as well. But insurance company has a process in which they normally insure the properties within a year. So their horizon of insuring any property normally resides in one year. The financial institutions, however, they are engaged for much longer, minimum two to three years up to 30 years in mortgage conditions. And if there is any such events that the insurance company walks away because the financial institution relies on the insurance as a backup option. And if the insurance walks away and the asset doesn't have any value, then the, property, the loan would be in default. So if you look at this situation, you realize that we have a lot of exposure around the world. If you travel in the emerging markets, you would see that this type of construction is popping up almost in many, many locations. 
But what is happening here is that we are basically building time bombs. And these time bombs are going to come, come up somewhere. We are already seeing fire events or other events happening around the world, which are outside the control of you know, the building systems are not being able to handle them. And this, this is story that I told you, it, it was a real story. It happened in Caribbean and the building is now in default and nobody can, um, can afford to fix it or, or do anything for that building. The other part of the story is um, the reality of today. Sometimes I feel when I, when I talk to my children, I feel like on one hand, we are lucky if we compare to previous generations, there are a lot more potential for new generation. But at the same time, I, sometimes I feel that we are in a very, very specific time in human history. We are in a major crossroad of human history. Ask why. If we look at the three pieces of this uh, puzzle, on one hand, we have urgency to do something for GHG emissions. If you read the IPCC report 2021, you know that we are barely having time up to 2050 to act on, on carbon emissions and reach zero carbon emissions. It's a large challenge at the same time. It's a, it's a big economic opportunity. It can create jobs, it can create new opportunities, new industries, if we act on it correctly. That's part of the storyline, so urgency to curb GHG emissions. On the other hand, we know that since 1917, thanks to increased emissions and increased human activity, we are saying that the nature, the modern nature is coming back to us and saying, if you're emitting more carbon, here is the result. There is more natural disasters. And if you look at the natural disasters history from 1970 to 2019, the graph on the right, you would see that the weather related the, and also flooding, the blue colors on the graph, are increasing. And the increase has more than doubled in areas, it's tripled. And this tripling the events, which we can feel around ourselves, is playing its part in creating damages. And these damages are impacting us. You, know, you probably have friends or families that they are being impacted by extreme weather events or flooding. We are seeing more and more wildfires. We are seeing more and more flooding, more um, heavy rains that uh, you know, leads to flash flood and damages to the buildings and communities. And the third piece of the puzzle is the digital revolution. And I think that's another piece that you know we are at the, the as humanity, we are somewhere that we are kind of excited, but at the same time we are we don't know what to do. We know that with the um, tech companies growing, they, they are getting more and more bigger and stronger. At the same time, there are more and more people accessing internet, they are accessing cell phones, and they, data is being um, gathered in a bigger and bigger chunks. And we know with this situation, the computer science and the computer um, power, computing power is getting to the point to surpass human brain power, which is an amazing and unknown and scary condition all at the same time. So in this crossroad where we have natural disasters, we have GHG emissions to deal with, and we have the digital revolution, and it seems like it's a perfect time to come up with a solution to be able to do something for carbon emissions, do something to 
care the conditions of natural disasters and take advantage of digital revolution. I'm not, I'm not here to scare you with the numbers, but in the last 20 years, 4.3 billion people are impacted by natural disasters. Almost half of the population of the globe today. The economic loss in last 20 years has been almost $3 trillion due to natural disasters. This has been doubled from the previous 20 years. And the interesting fact there is that when you look at many of the emerging markets, the assets are not insured. The insurance condition is not like developed countries. Many assets are not insured. Therefore, the losses are not really reported fully. So the losses, the actual losses is, is much higher than this. All right, so with, with this context, let's, let's look at what we can do. This is part of the, you know, if on the left-hand side, you see the different events and the losses, insured losses and uninsured losses. So the green color shows the insured losses and uh, orange color shows uninsured losses in different events. And they are in US dollar, in US, billion US dollars. So these events are really costly for nations. In some of the nations, this can cost them two to 3% of their GDP per year. And, and these conditions cannot continue and sustain. We are also in a global pandemic, which adds to the complications of um, natural disasters because the capacity of uh, economies are already strained with lots of pressure on economies. And having natural disasters as a second element on top of that creates problems. But the good news is that this is this can be a positive thing as well for us to start looking at the problem with a solution. So I'm an architect and as an architect, when I design a building, there was always this question mark of you know, how I'm gonna design my building to be resilient. And to do that, I was going to my structural engineer or the civil engineer and say, okay, what can we do to protect this building against flooding? Or what can we do to protect this building against earthquake? And the answer always was, yes, we will comply with the building codes. And by complying with the building codes, we should be safe. And obviously that's a, that's a good answer for everyone. Everyone feels like that that is the right thing to do. And that's the minimum thing that one needs to be doing and that's, that's correct. But the reality is that a lot of time we really don't know what are the natural hazards are happening or what are the natural hazards that can happen in the future. So that element is unknown. So identifying risk is one of the areas that we are uh, developing under building resilience index to enable every builder, every designer, every owner to understand what's up, what is gonna happen on that location that they are designing the building. So identification of the risk is step one. And when I talk about risk, it's a combination of hazard and vulnerability. So hazards, what are the natural hazards that are going to happen in that location, whether there would be that there's exposure to flood, there's exposure to high wind, earthquake, fire, wildfire. And then what are the vulnerabilities of your building and design? So what are the weak points? And to, together, this will um, create a risk for, for that location. Now, if you identify your risk, the second question is that what can we do? And in that example, yes, I will comply with the code, but the answer is that would code protect my assets? 
The codes are designed to minimize the cost of construction to protect human life. However, the codes are not designed to protect the asset. Uh, what it means, it means that they are doing the bare minimum to keep the people, let's say if there's a fire event, you design a building that it will stand the, the fire for one hour and you expect everyone to run down the stairs and get out of the building to uh, open the space and then let the building burn down or the fire department to come and shut the fire off. But with that, your building may not be protected. Your building may be damaged to the point of the, uh, the whole uh, building is at loss. The third piece is that, is there any disclosure? Do you know whether your building is at risk or not? What is the current disclosure mechanism? And there is none. Even in Florida, for example, in the United States, when that building collapsed uh, earlier this year, if I'm a renter in that building or I'm an owner in that building and there was um, people lost their lives there, and if there was a disclosure to say, this building is not safe, I may not have been renting any place there or buying any place there. Or if there was a disclosure to say there is a cost to improve this building and it's half a million dollars or 200 or $300,000 to improve the building, to protect it against that collapse. Surely the homeowners there would have paid that money to make that building resilient. But because there is no disclosure, there is no transparency, it's hidden and it's not seen, then everyone ignores it and the outcome becomes a catastrophe. So those are the three elements on the Building Resilience Index that will tie from identifying the problem, solving the problem and disclosing any residual risk. In Building Resilience Index, we try to look at three uh, verticals. Um, everything that related to high wind, to flood events or water events, including tsunami and other types, uh, fire and geoseismic. And these are the three criteria under which each, each building will be tested to look at whether building has enough physical integrity after these events to be protected. And the second, what is the potential for that building to operate in case there's a flooding and after flood or after events, whether that building can stay, stay um, and operate after that event. The Building Resilience Index has generated with these five levels, letter grades. And this is quite important uh, for us to understand. The minimum level is R. It means that the building fails to meet the requirement of any of the uh, other levels or any codes, and the building that cannot be, you know, there, there can be risks in this building. We don't know what it is, but it's not identified. So I would put every single building in a, in, in a town in R category, unless they can come and prove that they are not in R category. C level means that the building meets the bare minimum requirements of resilience. And if a building is C rated, it's not bad, it's good that it can uh, you know, get the bare minimum in place, but there, are, there can be improvements. B level means that the building meets the local best practices in a specific location. A level means that the building meets the global best practices in, in a specific location. And I would say that there might be just a few buildings with A level in each country because right now the A level requirement means that you are meeting the earthquake requirements from Tokyo and you are meeting the hurricane requirements from Florida and you are meeting the best practice flood requirements. So a level rated buildings are quite uh, quite highly resilient. 
And A plus means a building that is aerated and also has operational continuity measures so that like solar panels, for example, or it has additional water tank to be able to survive after even the city um, is being cut out. I was reading a story in Caribbean in Puerto Rico that after um, the hurricane, there was only one building that people can gather as a community because the, the um, city, the small town's connection to everywhere was cut and there was no electricity, no water, only one um, small building that had solar as a community center served as a place for people to come together to have electricity and light, to have a charging point, to have radio connection, to hear what's going on around the world. So that would be an A plus building. So in terms of the guidance that we can provide, what kind of guidance we can provide, we are providing a user guide and the user guide will run through each and every measure and we call them mitigation measures um, against each risk mitigation measures. And there are guidance on how to design and build the building using these conditions. And the user guide is available for free uh, for public use. And the building resilience index has been designed as an application that everyone would have access to. It's an open application for public good and our idea is that this will be used by everyone. And hopefully uh, we can continue seeing progress uh, being, uh, being used um, by, being, by using this application. How the Building Resilience Index works, it works um, quite easily. You start a project looking at a location map um, and selecting on the map a specific location. We are starting this program from Philippines and then in the Philippines, you can go and select a specific location in a street, for example. And by that selection, then the application reads from the database all the hazard conditions. And our goal is that we continue in enriching our data. Our goal is that at some point we would have crowdsourcing, machine learning, capabilities to be able to read data from different sources and provide you the best solution possible in that specific location. So the first step is to look at what are the applicable hazards in that location. For example, in this location, there's cyclone, there's volcano, there's landslide. And after selecting these elements, then the application uh, provides a list of mitigation measures relevant to those natural hazards. And these mitigation measure, measures then the engineers of the building needs to say, okay, whether they are meeting these requirements, yes, no, or not applicable. And by selecting these uh, measures, then they, they can get a rating for their specific, for a specific category. So for example, this building is getting to A level for winds. After doing all the assessment for all categories, then uh, the building gets a verification um, letter grade. For example, this CBU, the A side condos, gets A rated. A rated means that the building is and has a very high, high rating. And this data then can be disclosed on the website for everyone else to, to look at it. Or um, the building developer can print this and take it to the bank or to the insurance company and say, look, my building has this a specific rating. Um, and it's, it's a verified rating that my building has this level of resilience in, in, uh, in its design or is it, it's, in, it's in construction. And the banks and insurance companies, they can have an, an access to the different projects. They can see the rating for different projects. They can see the size, the year built, as well as the cost of mitigation for different elements. This can also be a tool for the donors and the development agencies to provide financing to improve the resilience of the projects. 
So there is the cost of verification, cost of uh, verification, but also cost of improvements that one um, one can provide. Imagine one day we would have rating for every single building in a town, in a city. And this then provides benefit to the uh, buildings that they have higher ratings. And also this can provide opportunities for improvements for the buildings that they have lower ratings. And by this, we can create jobs, we can, you know, the build builders, they can provide support for retrofitting these buildings. And um, we, we are developing also another program on the edge green building certification that comes with energy efficient retrofit. So combining energy efficiency retrofit and resilience retrofit in a project to improve that uh, project to a higher grade, let's say from R to C level or from C to B level, from B to A level. So we want to uh, gradually improve the quality of the buildings to be more resilient, but at the same time, to be more efficient. You may ask, okay, what if we just demolish building and build a new one? In some cases, we may um, end up doing that, but the reality is that the embodied carbon within the building materials is taking more and more importance in the, in the global stage. Roughly, these days, the carbon emissions due to uh, embodied carbon in materials is around 10% of lifetime operational emissions of a building, depending on the uh, on an average in emerging markets. But this is gonna improve because when we make the buildings more efficient and supply more renewable energy, then the building materials as a portion will increase, the impact of building materials will, will increase. So last thing we want to do is demolish buildings and build new buildings because we are adding more emissions through um, embodied carbon of the materials. And one of the questions that one can ask is that why we should do this, why we should uh, do more resilient buildings. And the answer to that is that uh, the investment in resilience is not a, actually, um, it's not a cost, it's an investment. Because when you uh, put $1 for resilience, you're saving $6 in repair costs. And this is a study that has been done by Nas National Institute of Building Science here in the United States. And it looks at the cost versus benefit of um, doing anything to improve the resilience. For example, if you put $1 against flood resilience in your building, in your house, in your office building, if there's a flood event, you would be saving $6 in cost of repairs. If you invest $1 for wind resilience, you would be saving $10 after a high wind event. So there are all benefits that you can see here that can uh, bring benefit to the, to the country or to the building owner or developer. So what we are doing at IFC, it's a program that we wanted to ensure different players in the marketplace, they play their roles, um, develop building developers, uh, through the investment programs, we want to encourage more resilience investments in the building sector, direct investments that either we are doing or other international um, investment organizations are doing, uh, the likes of Asian Development Bank, European Development Bank, and other banks. Um, on the other hand, we want to encourage local um, commercial banks and financial institutions to adopt building resilience index as a policy for them to monitor their investments. There's no need to invest in a specific, you know, force a specific level of uh, building resilience, but maybe at the start to scan projects using building resilience index and see which grade each project is um, standing at. We also encourage governments and uh, cities to come and 
work on incentives to put incentives for more resilient buildings. Building Resilience app is going to help architects and designers to identify. So if you are an architect or designer, we encourage you to use our application, give us feedback, but also take that for your project designs. Um, here, we also invite governments or um, organizations that have access to risk maps to come and collaborate with us. We'd be happy to bring that data uh, to the front um, and center of the building residence index uh, to provide access to information. As banks and financial institutions, we would be happy to share our um, know-how with them uh, to take this building residence index and use it in their investment projects. At the end, I want to thank our uh, donors. Building residence index currently founded by government of Netherlands and supported by Australian government. We also have are thankful to the organizations that they have been supporting the Living Resilience Index through different means of technical support as well as um, supporting our um, committee to develop the Building Resilience Index uh, information. At the end, I want to thank the organizers of the of this summit and welcome everyone's comments. Uh, you can reach out to us at pri at ifc.org or www.resilienceindex.com. You can also follow us on Twitter, on LinkedIn, and on Resilience Index. Thank you so much and have a wonderful day. Bye bye.